you know what you knew. And yet still you all are left happy. Some are seeing. It's just too late. Total extinction. How did we reach where we are? One percent with the lies and power. Their system, system of greed, is cannibalizing our mother. Things, things, things are more things. things and more things. How the system keeps going, selling us. Selling us. Some say it's too late for turning Poison in the air Sea and land them The body of our mothers burning Our children, our children And children of our children Look into our eyes with a question How could we know what we knew back then? It's just too late And still let it happen Some are saying it's just too late that it's too late Total extinction's our fate But we've not reached the end of a road Is a degree of a fraction of Good afternoon, good evening, welcome from wherever you are in the world. My name is Diana McCauley and I'm a Jamaican environmental activist and a writer. And it's my honor and privilege to guide you through a conversation today. Critical Conversations is a series of online events hosted and organized by the Commonwealth Foundation, which is part of the Commonwealth Pe Commonwealth People's Forum. And our discussion today is part of the climate justice series, and we'll be posting links to earlier events in the chat. Welcome. You've all just seen the video, 1.5 to Stay Alive, produced by Panos Caribbean as part of the 1.5 to Stay Alive campaign that supports Caribbean and other vulnerable countries in the fight against the climate crisis. The lyrics are by Kendall Hippolyte, who is with us today, and Taj Weeks. The 27th meeting of the Conference of the Parties of the UN Framework on Climate Change has just concluded in Egypt, otherwise called COP27. My husband asked me the other day, so what is this COP27 thing? And we hope to delve into what the COP achieved and or didn't achieve as we talk today. 
We are, our panelists are from islands and we are from continents and we hope our discussion today will explore the very different climate challenges faced by people in incredibly diverse countries. Please use the Q&A function and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can and the chat function to talk with each other as well. To help us navigate these warming waters, if you'll allow me that metaphor, are our wonderful panelists. Audrey Brown Pereira is an innovative poet of the Cook Islands. She's Maori and Samo of Maori and Samoan descent, and she works for the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environmental Program in Samoa. Welcome, Audrey. And I said when I saw her, I wish I had a flower. We also have Ina Maria Shikongo, a tapestry artist based in Namibia who uses her art for activism. And of course, a big part of what we're going to be talking about today is how art feeds into activism, how art reaches people's hearts. My friend Kendall Hippolyte, award-winning poet, playwright and director from St. Lucia and advocate for social and environmental justice. Kendall, I've hardly ever used your last name. I think I got it wrong. But anyway, welcome. <laughs> And Okalani Marina, artist, poet, environmental activist, and social entrepreneur from Samoa. Welcome, Okalani. And I think she has a flower too. So I think we I think I want to start at the COP. You know, they, we've been meeting, we've been having conferences of the parties for 27 years and civil society has attended them. And so, and some of our panelists were present at COP27. So I want to start by asking for some reflections on COP27. How was art or creativity used there if you saw it, if it, it was used to raise awareness of climate change in new and different ways? Um, especially the Mana Moana Pacifica voices. And what do you think these examples teach us about what might work and where efforts should be directed? Can I start with you, Ina Maria? <laughs> okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, well, I was uh, part of the loss and damage action, the, pl the blue ladies, we would call them. And our action was called flooding the cops. So what we did, uh, a few days prior to the main event was just walk within the space wearing these blue dresses just to arouse curiosity. And then on the day itself, it was quite uh, a powerful day because as we had the action, we were just dancing and uh, uh, Can, Can International, they were giving some speeches, but just at that specific moment, Joe Biden drove past and the whole crowd went mad crazy turning towards joe biden and uh regardless of what we did achieve or what we did not achieve at least we got loss and damage within the text whether we as activists had an important play to play i mean an, an important role to play in this uh i don't know but i feel that without our voices we would not have gotten loss and damage within the text itself yeah, I think I think it's often very difficult to disaggregate what caused what, you know, it's difficult to say that this this certain thing that took place on the day had the result of what happened. You know, I, I think of it more as water dripping on a stone, gradually wearing away at something that looks very strong, but but will eventually be worn away. Audrey, your reflections on the cup? Yes, the COP process is a very complex one because you've got the negotiations process inside rooms that, that not everybody has access to, but you also have side events that provide the, a voice, different perspectives on the issues impacting our Pacific Islands and also our other brothers and sisters throughout the world. And then you also have our activists, our NGOs and our governments. So through the different perspectives, it adds that richness of texture to amplify the impacts of climate change and why we need to stay at 1.5 to stay alive. So all of this, all these threads come together to make a voice and our artists hit at the uh, at the heart of the issue. They transcend the science, the policy, and they make that impact that is universal. Thank you. What, what strikes me when you see the coverage, you know, on television or on the internet is, you know, you see the, all these people in suits, right? And, and, and the very large delegations from big countries 
And then you see the the NGOs and the civil society actors, and and I think they remind us of what's at stake. This is not just a question of us less meeting in a conference room and come up with some words. This is it brings to us real people with real lives. That's that's what I how I think about it when I when I see those things. Okalani, what about you? What what are your reflections on COP? Um, Talofa, just to reintroduce myself again, my name is Okalani Marina, um, and I'm from the Pacific. So I'm from Samoa in the Pacific Islands. It's a very small um, island nation with a population of only 200,000 people. And because of our unique placement within the Pacific, we have a very unique perspective as people who are at the front lines experiencing the climate crisis in full. And so when you come, at, when you think of arts and climate justice, a lot of the work we do at a grassroots level is storytelling. Um, and my people are innately storytellers. So a lot of the work we do when it comes to activism is really telling our story. And what we wanted to do at COP is really amplify the voices of community leaders who were really doing the work for climate justice, but did not have the privilege to come to COP. And so our work while we were at COP were sharing their frontline truths. Um, so I was very honored to be a part of um, the launching of the Frontline Truths website, which is a website that collects all the stories of climate leaders um, and climate activists within the Pacific who have been doing the work and have been telling their stories for years and years, um, but giving them a platform in which their stories can always stay and people can learn and absorb and hold space. So um, with COP, what we found personally is it, it is quite an exclusive um, conference. And so it's only if you know, you know, and the people who go to COP are the people who have been doing this work or are very much involved in these conversations for years and years. And so for the general public, it's very intimidating to be part of climate conversations because they feel that they're um, under-equipped or um, not adequately placed to have these conversations. Um, so a lot of the role that the Pacific did was to provide a space in which people could share their stories, could hold space and feel like they're welcomed in an environment that isn't exclusive, that isn't completely high level with a lot of text and a lot of jargon. It's just simply tell your story in what way you want, in which medium you feel most comfortable in, whether it be tapestry, whether it be poems, whether it be music and dance. A lot of the work we did was really holding that space within COP. Um, so I think I, I think I took up too much time, but, but what's a little bit of <laughs> I was about I to wave at you. <laughs> So thank, uh, thank you for that. Yes, I've got my, I, I myself, I'm a storyteller. And so I think all these various ways that we reach people's hearts are so very important. And Kendall, what about you? What were your hopes for the COP? Yeah, unmute. Yeah, if I'm going to be absolutely brutally frank, um, I really didn't have much hope, frankly. Um, after Glasgow last year, um, I, I really didn't. So I was really, quite frankly, amazed that the loss and damage actually got embedded in the way that it did. Because you know, um, ever, ever since 2015, when I was when I first became aware more of these issues, I, I was aware of it as a as a really salient issue. I didn't expect this year that it would have gotten through. That to me, I didn't see any any reason why it would have more than the previous years. So um I so I'm 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 grateful for that. I know that is that is just another phase of the battle beginning because of, you know um agreeing is one thing and actually getting the money through and so on is another. But overall I'm not as um quite as as pessimistic isn't quite the word because I'm never absolutely pessimistic, but I, I'm not quite as skeptical at the end of it as I was at the beginning of it. So um, big kudos and thanks to all those persons out there on the front line doing, doing the work of those the tough, tough, tough work of, of negotiations um, in this. Yeah. Sure. So yeah, I, I, I too went, in, went into COP from a distance being, you know, somewhat Unhope, unhopeful, and I think we did we did end up with more than seemed likely at at the outset. But mm -hmm. can, can I ask you all what you know something about your takeaways from from the COP, but also to reflect a little bit on time because I think one of the issues about the climate crisis is 
we don't we don't have unlimited time to to sort this matter out you know in fact our, the, the the situation is getting worse each year and and some deadlines are upon us some possibly tipping points that make these problems irreversible so in your reflections about what your takeaways were from the cop talk to me a little bit about how you how you see time and i'm going to start with you audrey thank you diana one of the key issues for the pacific is this is not a matter of choice. This is a matter of life. Mm. There is urgency. So from our perspective, the time is now. We can't wait. We need to have action now. And that's why the Pacific was in full force. Regardless of your hat, you were there for a common cause. And that was to the address and make it known the issues of survival regarding climate change for our Pacific Island people. Right. Yeah. Um, how do we how do we get that urgency uh, uh, across, though? Um, Okalani? Or let me put um, it another way. Do you think our leaders and those who they are there negotiating feel that urgency? The Pacific has always been fighting to keep um, the temperature rising to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And climate scientists have always said there is a slim chance, but there is still a window of opportunity. So for us in the Pacific, um, I am very fortunate that our government also aligns with our goals to really push for 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, so a lot of the work we do is really supporting our leaders in the Pacific whether they're in negotiating, we're, we're, we're cheering them on outside, you know, we're clapping for them and we're applauding for them as they go inside to really give them that boost of energy as they prepare. Um, but the Pacific does very much see it as an urgent need um, and an urgent issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so I do find that with our leaders, specifically when we're talking about climate crisis, a lot of the work we do is really urging for these financing, um, for loss and damage to be put in the text, for fossil fuels to be put in the text. So what was your main takeaway um, from, from this meeting, Akalani? COP27 was actually my first ever COP. Okay. Um, so when I walked in, I, was, I wasn't really, I had zero expectations. Um, a lot of people were like, you know, this is a high level event, but also the, the same people that were my mentors were like, you know, I've been here for years. I'm sick of it. If I had a choice, I wouldn't come to COP, but I can't, <laughs> I can't be afforded that opportunity. So we come every year. So, you know, it was a lot of mixed feelings. And so I really came in there with an open heart and an open mind, but a lot of my my key takeaways was really seeing a lot more change. Um, and just like Kendall mentioned, it was quite disheartening for the first week of COP to see that they were planning to remove loss and damage from the text. Um, and they were planning to reverse everything that was happening in Glasgow. So um, it was it was difficult to stay hopeful. But a lot of the things I, I did was um, I cannot be afforded the privilege of being um, in despair. Um, because the people that profit off of my grief are responsible for destroying the planet. Um, so I have no other choice but to stay hopeful. Yeah, that's those are those are good reflections. So Ina Maria, you're going to share with us some of your artworks. And so I can ask all the panelists to mute. Okay, um, so this is my artwork. Uh, you know, when we talk about climate justice, uh, if we talk about the global north, it is we talk about uh, the rivers drying up, we talk about uh, the forest fires, but when it comes to the global south, we are also talking about human rights violations that we don't really want to expose or even talk about. So that is what climate justice is. It is for us to finally get what we need okay like loss and damage is on the text but what is next after after the after the text has been included within the sharm el sheikh agreement or whatever it is that you are busy calling it so climate justice is just not about uh the polar bear and the ice sinking but it is also about saving lives as we can see what is happening in africa in in uh, India, the floods, the droughts, uh, it's it is a matter of survival, and it's not a matter of uh, just going out with your sign just to protest. So this is what climate justice means to me. 
And loss and damage being on the text is not enough for me. We want action happening right now. So we can help our communities within the just transition, like they call it, like we shouldn't even call it just transition, we should call it immediate transition. So we can finally get climate justice. Um, and uh, Stop ECOP is uh, actually a campaign that is inspired by my by my colleagues in uh, Uganda, where you see Total, a company from France, uh, coming to Uganda in Tanzania to build the longest pipeline on the continent, and it will and it is going through a number of nature reserves, displacing a lot of people. We are talking about more than a million people, and it will be carrying hot, heated oil. So now just imagine a herd of elephants literally destroying this pipeline. What is going to happen to those people? And at the same time, we are talking about keeping uh, the targets under 1.5. And this project is literally compromising the targets. It is compromising the people of Uganda and Tanzania, but also it is a project that is happening in Uganda right now, but we will be seeing more of these projects on the African continent as we are currently experiencing an energy crisis, a so-called energy crisis. So Stop ECOP was literally inspired by my counterparts or my fellow activists within Uganda. And it is one of our most successful campaigns on the African continent, where even today we saw investors pulling out of this project in, in, in including the World Bank. So activism does work. You know, I don't have to be in Uganda. I don't have to be at COP, but just for you to realize that this is a project that is happening right now through the screen, I am hopeful that you will also join the campaign to completely face out when we talk about gas and oil and coal. Um, next slide. <laughs> this was our loss and damage action at uh, during COP uh, 27, which I believe for me was very, very, very successful because uh, we managed to raise awareness with with people within that had no idea what activism is about. We were not necessarily shouting all the time, but we were dancing. And we were just telling the people, hey, the flood is coming. And this is the action that I was talking about where prior to this day, we were actually walking within the space below. And even after the action, we, we had the permission to stand right in front of the door where the negotiators were walking into like two days before COP ended with our signs, which, which, which was amazing. And I think one of the most successful things that I take away from COP, even though it was sort of controversial, is the fact that we could actually have our protest within the blue zone, which is not what we had in Glasgow, but that at least helped us get the attention of the decision makers. I mean, Japan, Switzerland, and the USA, they did not want to even hear about the text. But now it's, they did not want to hear about loss and damage finance, but now it is within the text. So that is just the beginning of climate justice, but it is not uh, what I am hoping to get, uh, what I'm hoping to get is immediate action. And if we move on to the next slide, I'm trying to be really fast. Um, so this is a piece. The fossil fuel non uh, non uh, pro pro proliferation treaty. It is an initiative, and it is also one of the many solutions when we are talking about facing out. When we are talking about what can we do to have a just transition. So the three pillars of the fossil fuel non proliferation treaty, which is basically uh, stopping all new uh, coal, oil, gas projects, facing out. That's it. Uh, just just a transition, but also the fact that you know someone has to pay for it. So who's going to pay for it? Polluters. They are busy making a killing ever since the war started in Russia. I mean, in uh, in uh, Ukraine, okay. and we are talking about uh, fossil fuel companies, and which is why we need we need to tackle this 
facing out issue as a global community, which is why the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is very important. Vanuatu, Tuvalu, they signed up onto it. Uh, London, the Vatican, they signed up onto it. And now we are waiting for the rest of the world to literally also sign onto it and at the same time start really facing out and not just sign on it because we will come for you for accountability. So this is what my art is about. Africa is not a dumpster. It's basically all that plastic pollution that is ending up in Africa. This is a campaign inspired by my Kenyan counterparts where they signed deals with the USA, now the governments, the USA and the, and the UK at the time, where all of that plastic rubbish ended up in Kenya or it, or it ends up in Africa actually. And which is why we are saying Africa is not a dumpster. Plastic is a byproduct of oil. Again, it is polluting our rivers. It is polluting our lands. And at the same time, our livestock are also consuming this plastic. So the people that are actually responsible for creating these plastic products, they are the ones who should take it back. They are the ones who should be making sure that we dispose of these products, but not for them to end up on the African continent. Africa has given enough to the global North. We are not just talking about a, a colonialism or this neo-colonialism that is happening like this dash for, uh, for a gas in Africa right now. We are talking about real climate justice taking responsibility and accountability and also reminding the global north that what they are experiencing now is just the beginning for us in africa like in namibia being the driest country in sub-saharan africa we know what it's like to feel the drought we know what it's like to not have water but do you know so our current present is the future of the global north and that is why we have to come together as a community to to help the countries within the global south that have been overly exploited already for such a long time for them to go through a just transition and stop greenwashing gas is not a clean energy gas is gas pollutes our underground water we don't want your plastic in africa take care of it coca-cola you know this is our continent. We have our own ways of living. And also when we talk about just transition, also know that we indigenous people are the ones with the solutions. And that is why we want to be part of the discussion and not be sidelined as usual. Thank you. Good job, you know, Maria. I know, I know it's a lot, you know, um, to get through. And thank you for sharing, sharing your art with us. And I, I definitely, also understand this, the, the, your last slide. Well, I understand all of it, but your last slide, Africa is not a dumpster, I think is powerful and, and, and resonated. Um, so thanks very much. So can I just remind all the other panelists to turn their cameras back on while we move into our next section, which is on arts and climate act, act, activism. So we're kind of leaving our discussion about, about the COP in Africa, the Caribbean and the Pacific Islands. And, and, and when, when I was first asked to do this, I noticed how many of us who were part of the panel were from island nations. And I feel there is, you know, this very significant difference between island nations and, and continents, larger countries. And I, I, I'm an islander myself, I born here, lived here all my life. And in a way, and I will want you to challenge me on this and, and tell me how, how you see it. I think if you live on an island, these problems are extremely close to you. And, you know, rising sea levels is not an abstract thing because the, the sea is very close to us as island people. And I would like us to talk a little bit about the difference between either very large countries or continents. Um, you know, Maria has talked very eloquently about Africa, um, how, how different types of countries see, see these problems. And we're talking about art here. So how can, how can, how can the arts bring awareness of these issues. So Ina Maria sh shared for her with us her art. I want to ask, how how is it transmitted? You know, how do you all get your art? How do you get your stories read or listened to? How do you get people to see what what you're creating? So these these were my thoughts on the difference between islands and continents. And so um I'd like to hear your thoughts. Kendall, can we start with you? 
Maybe you could actually tell us a bit more about the 1.5 campaign, how it started. And I know you wrote the song and the lyrics. So yeah. some reflections on that, maybe. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, first of all, the, the, the 1.5 campaign thing, um, that, 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 that was like kind of like in two parts in a way. Um, because because that at first came came in on that um, for for COP twenty one um, in twenty fifteen um, via Panos, and there, 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 there were two there were two prongs to this. One, um, I had worked with um, with some young actors and music well not young some actors and musicians, and we had created a, a, a device piece a theater we had devised a theater piece, um, which we had done in a couple of communities. We had, we had really hoped to be able to take it to to more communities. Um, but the funding was not what, what we had, you know, had, had hoped for, but you were able to, um, to, to take it to a couple of communities and had a question and answer session and so on going on it. Um, and, um, for me, theater, I mean, it, it, it really is, I don't want to digress too much, but theater really is, is the art form where you can really reach people in, 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 you know, mind, soul, body, every, every way. And, and, and pe people feel energized to, to speak and, and, and you know, to after, after a theater, after a, a theater performance. So, so there was that, but there was also, yeah, my involvement with the, um, with, with the creating lyrics for the song. Um, the, the Panos um, chairperson at the time, Yves Renard, broached the idea. And um, the, f the first one that, that, that I had done, the idea had always been, which we did, to have voices from around the Caribbean. So I'd written the, the lyrics for one, um, one, 1. 1.5, To Stay Alive. Um, and, so, and we had um, singers from a number of different Caribbean countries contributing their voices to it. It was a very, very interesting technical process working with the, the musician who created the melody and did all the technical work and so on for it. And um, I really did have a strong sense, honestly, that um, taking on your point that, that there's no one thing that tips the balance and makes a difference. It's impossible to, to pinpoint that. But I really did have a strong feeling, a strong sense um, that that the, the 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 role that that the arts played that 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 the song played at COP twenty one, where I think it really did make a difference to actually you know bring bringing bring bring the decision to, uh, for for it to be adopted, and of course all the the tough negotiations going on um, behind it. Um, the the second song, which is what the the excerpt that was played, so one point five is still alive, was a reminder because that's the thing. There was a feeling after after COP after COP twenty one, and hopes are so high. There's a kind of feeling that, all right, so these pledges have been made, but I mean, people aren't meeting there. There's this, this, the question you mentioned about urgency, how much you know, time, that it just doesn't seem to be you know, being taken seriously. So, so the second song um, was in fact a reminder, 1.5 is still alive. It was meant to be a reminder for, 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 for COP25 in, um, in, in Poland, I think it was. It was supposed to be a reminder that, listen, people, this is still, you know, um, this, this, this is still live. In fact, it's even more live now because the more time goes, the more desperate things become, you know. Um, for that one, I, I can't, I, we, we didn't do as active a campaign like within my own island itself, in terms of getting stuff out to, to communities and groups. We didn't do exactly a campaign um, on it. The song happened and yes, it, 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 you know, it, it went out on the media and so on. I wish there had been a corresponding effort um, that would have taken fan funding. Now, I wish there had been a corresponding effort as it had been with, with the first one to take the message out to communities, you know? So, so can I ask you just to briefly talk a little bit about that? Because I was going to ask, you know, how, how do we transmit these things? It's one thing to create, but yeah. you've got to get eyes that's, and people to hear, you know? So talk to us a little bit about how the, the first aspect of the campaign where community work yeah. was done to get it into the communities. Yeah, but brief, I mean, but, but you have to be brief. Okay. Sorry, well, sorry. I mean, frankly, it would not have happened without the involvement of Panos because Panos was it was Panos who actually went out and got the funds from the Caribbean Development Bank um, to do, to help do that kind of community outreach work within St. Lucian. I know it was done in Jamaica as well. Um, I can't say specifically. We I don't know why that didn't happen um, for you know for for for, for, for the um, for, for for COP for COP twenty five. I don't know. But to me, we we need we we the artists. We need to be partnered with organizations who have the resources 
um, that can that can fund the work we do because creating the work is one thing, as you say, getting it out is another. Social media helps up to a point, but honestly, there's nothing that beats the direct interaction of persons and, and life feel of communities taken, you know. When 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 we did the first one, I'll, I'll very, very brief. I mean, the, 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 the theater production that, that we've done, um, bits of it were taken like the schools. They, they, they were bits of it were, were done like like you know, in a in a what, what, what we'd call like a rum shop, uh, you know, a, a pub in St. Lucia with, with, with an audience who were interacting there. Bits of it were done like at community meetings. We didn't always have to do the whole thing, you know? So more of that needs to happen, but that takes, that takes funding, that takes money. Um, sure. we, we, need, we need to partner with who can help. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. Kind yeah. of. Audrey, do you want to talk to us a bit about arts and climate activism in the Pacific? Sure. Look, I just want to talk about the Mana Moana Pacifica Voices, which was used at COP27. And basically what it was, was an opportunity to bring our poets and artists in a digital form to the COP process. So Okolani Marina is one of our poets. So one of the key aspects on the messaging was not just the impacts of climate change, but also the interconnected relationship of Pacific Island people with the earth land and sea. And that's really important to emphasize because it was a way to show the world these are our poets. So we had a lot of our, um, you call our stars of poetry, from John Pule to Konai Thaman to the late Teresia Tiawa, with our younger voices like Okolani and uh, Yafili. And it was a way to message that these things are not new and that there is also urgency to hear us, to see us, and bringing it in a digital form, it's also able to live beyond the COP itself. So it will trans transcend time and, and, and borders, but also show this is a matter of survival. So I'll leave Okalani to add more onto it, but that was one of the great things about the Mana Moana Pacifica Voices, uh, to be able to bring those people to this space that will live beyond the COP process and also show the world our voices and our lived experiences, both past and present. Okay, thank you. Um, and Okalani, you're going to perform for us, are you not? Yes, I guess I am. <laughs> so, do you want to take it? Do you want to take it away? Of course. Um, so the poem I wrote uh, is titled "Remember Me, um, Remember Us," um, and I actually wrote this five years ago as a letter to my grandfather in grief because um, he passed away. So over the years, it actually evolved less of a promise to him about what I would do and more of a promise to myself about what I would do in order to make sure that um, the planet I leave, the next generation, is one that they are proud of. And it starts like this. He told me how I was born from water and earth, when the land and sea wove my mother and father's destiny together that my life is tied to the saltwater seas as deeply as my spirit is rooted in the earth. Remember, Fulisie Langitele, he said. Remember to tell our story to your children. Tell them they are coconut husk, dipped in salt water and woven into our fue with stories of our past. And tell them that the ocean no longer speaks to us that the wind no longer whispers and the earth is stilled beneath our feet. My unborn children will never know the land and sea as I have. The ocean I have been called to protect is poisoned. The cord that tethers me home is tearing my roots to the land, rotting. The same spirits that breathe life into me cry out that our earth is dying. To my unborn children, I will fight for you. I swear by the Moana I have been called to protect and the Fanua I am bound to, I will fight for you. Remember I fought for you, that we fought for you. Remember we fought those whose hands were stained with blood and oil. 
Remember we fought those who stood by and asked us to grieve instead of rage. And so when your roots flourish and the seas sing to you again, remember us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Okalani. So that was Remember Us. That was a that was the, the the name of it. Do you do you have any reflections yourself about um, the activism in the Pacific using the arts? I think as island people um, and saltwater people, we have been really gifted with this art of storytelling. Um, it's the way we've passed down indigenous and traditional knowledge within our communities and within our um, within our people. And so because of that gift of storytelling, we are very specially placed to be at COP and be in platforms where we are meant to tell our stories and with art in regards to climate justice, I really see us as people who humanize um, the climate crisis because often at times when you're at COP27, um, it's very high level, it's a suit and tie, you look at text, um, there's statistics and numbers, but there's no story, there's no humanizing that these are people who are disproportionately affected by the decisions others made. These are communities who are being affected currently and not in the future. Um, and so when I see art, I see it as a way to humanize the crisis. I see it as a way to connect with people in a way that that ties emotion together and empathy and brings that conversation really back down to the grassroots level rather than having it at a high level um, text statistics <laughs> conferencing um, conversation. And so um, I was really grateful to be a part of a lot of the movements who were really using art um, as activism within COP and within these spaces. Right, thank you. Just reminding everyone or panelists to um, have your cameras on. Um, and I want to ask Ina Maria, if you, what do you, what are your reflections? What do you think about the the difference between islands and large countries or whole continents? Um, do we do we need different approaches? Um, do we face different things? Do you do you see a difference between island peoples and big countries or continents? I think it is quite relative because when we look at Africa, for example, uh, like the drought that is currently happening in the Horn of Africa, it is quite severe. And it is also happening within my country in Namibia. Like right now we can see a lot of people migrating from the village life coming to the city because the rain is just not coming. You know, some parts of Namibia haven't seen rain in over 10 years. And, and these droughts are just becoming more and more frequent. If we are talking about coastal towns, then they are also facing the same problems that the Pacific Islands are actually facing. And, um, and then again, we also have the floods that are also happening just like they happened in Pakistan. It is, we are talking about Sudan, we are talking about uh, 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 Sierra Leone, uh, Uganda, even uh, Cameroon. So, um, when it comes to continents, we are talking about more people in terms of masses, but in terms of urgency, it is definitely the same because all lives matter at the end of the day, regardless of where we come from. And even if we are talking about the global north, which we keep on excluding when it comes to uh, the climate crisis, which is why I'm asking my counterparts to please wake up because this is not a global south issue anymore. It is a global north issue as well, and which is why they should be with us on the front line to tell the governments that enough is enough you know just like our livelihoods have been impacted for the past uh, decades for them it's, it's starting now so it is the same but just at a larger scale when we talk about continental um uh, the climate breakdown for example it's just on a larger scale yeah uh, the, the scale the scale is different. Kendall, do you have reflections on that? The difference between islands and 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 continents or large countries. I really I really take your point, Ina Maria, about the global north, though, because they they are. I think you know maybe fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, they thought, oh, we'll be we'll be fine, and they're not fine. 
and you know it's playing out within their borders as well so yes i do think we need to make better common cause with people in the global north but kendall do you have reflections about the difficult uh, any yeah. difference in approach between um, large countries and small ones not, not hugely fundamentally um i i, I support everything um, in america uh, maria was saying a while ago um for me it's maybe more of um more matter of, of and that's my impression that within at least within small island communities like the one where I'm in, um, it's once you, once you, once you, once you can get your resources and so on together, it's easier to to make contact in a more fundamental kind of way. By that I mean, for me, everything in art is a matter of of, of head and heart and hand. You, you need you, you need the intellect there. Um, but the intellect can make can make can make the action can make the hand work. What makes the hand get involved is is when when it reaches the heart, you know. And and getting that union of head and heart and hand, it's it seems to me it's easier in small communities, or you know, and and you're more likely to get small cohesive communities, even though they're under pressure. Um, in in the in the in the island situations, you know. Um, but but beyond that, to me, it is really fundamentally the same. It's just a matter of time, really and truly. So, right, yeah. and, may, and maybe big countries are comprised of a whole lot of small, of small, small communities, communities yeah, really. Yeah, and maybe that's yeah, that, yeah. that that's a fundamental lesson. Absolutely. So, so Audrey, what do you think um, the arts do different when it comes to activism versus you know just the standard approaches of activism? What do you think the arts bring to activism? Well, I want to go back to Okolani's comments about humanizing things. And if there's one thing that the arts do, it's connect to the heart. It's yes. able to give you a voice. It's able to give you that platform to describe what you're feeling, what you're observing, what you're listening to. So that's why the arts transcend a lot of policy, a lot of the negotiations texts, because people can make a very complex matter very simple in a song, accessible to the heart, to the mind, that you can repeat things again and again and again that connect with an audience both old and young. That's what the arts do. And the arts live beyond us. I mean, look at look at our heritage now, but look at what's possible in the future. Just going back to that issue of what's the difference between the islands and, and the larger countries, I just want to highlight for the Pacific Islands, we are the blue Pacific continent. We have 300, more than 300 million square kilometers of ocean. So while we should not compare apples and oranges, I just want to highlight why for us in the islands, the climate change and ocean nexus is very real. Thank you. Yeah, we, sh we <clears throat> sorry, we shouldn't forget the sea and we shouldn't forget mm -hmm. the water, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So Kendall, you're going yeah. to perform for us now, Fashioners yeah. of Progress. So yeah. reminding everyone to mute for this and go ahead, Kendall. Yeah. Um, again, listen to to, to Anna Maria and to talk about the 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 the, um, the pipeline, the gas thing. So much of this is coming out of a certain idea of progress that has been promulgated. You know, the, the climate, the climate change, and the climate justice issues are coming out of a certain view of what progress is, which is such crap. Anyway, um, yeah. So so this poem is directed to the the, the so called leaders, fashioners of progress, fashioners of progress because you do not heed the voices of our imagination, neither the tongues of trees nor the voices of poets. Earth will erupt in a conspiracy of poetry and nature. Earthquake and the landslide will snap and grind to rubble your bale high idols of concrete and metal. Fire will shrivel the prefabricated palaces, swelling like boils on our inflamed land. Wind will shatter the thin cocktail glass illusions of our progress into glittering dust, scattering over the ruins of casinos and the high-rise cemeteries made low. See, gnashing at our degraded shoreline, will form corrosive spume that will dissolve your headstones they will return to sand. But the poet's words will last. 
You will hear them prophesying in the hurricane, their warnings in the night sea, whispering towards your chambers. It will be the poet's words coming at you in the thundering sermon of the landslide, in the revenging wind swearing down through the valley, in the crackling of the sun gone wild. And when the earth has had her say and retribution, afterward, in the green time of healing, there will be other words given to other poets. They will be precious stones with healing properties. Mixed with dirt, folded in leaves, and used as poultices, they will protect the children who recite them. But these words now are for you. David stones found at the river of reflection and gathered in a poem ready. Come, fashioners of progress, come. You hold the steel cuffs of the law, the silver coins of bribery, the gun. But when you see a poet writing poems, run. Great words, Kendall. Thank, thank you for that. Um, mm. when, when you see a poet run, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm going to get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> so can can I ask you all to think about two things, the extent to which, or let's talk about two things, the extent to which art helps to bring in new and diverse voices into any social, me any social movement, but particularly this one. And also I want to, uh, us to talk a little bit about hope, because in some ways the, the, the climate crisis and the, and the struggle for climate justice is, is of very long standing. And on, on some weeks, I stand in a place where it seems, it seems almost hopeless. So does art help us with that? Does art help us with those moments when we look around and think, you know, this isn't, we're not actually going to succeed and, and and it is going to be a question of mourning. So let's talk a little bit about how art brings in new voices and and how art and artistic endeavors, creativity brings us brings us hope. And maybe I'll start with you, Audrey. You know, one of the most important things in, in the artistic scene is to enable newer voices, newer artists to come through. So going back to the Manamuana Pacifica uh, series that we've done was trying to bring the old and the new together. And a lot of it is the promise. What was the point of the past if we cannot learn from it? And when we've got these younger voices that are able to share their, their insight, their perspectives, because they give us hope. And for me as a mom, uh, sure, there are days where it, it seems rather gloomy, but art provides that heartbeat that anything is possible. And I think if you look at history and even our own oratory, our own uh, cultural aspects, there has to be hope. But how do we, how do we frame that hope? How do, they, how do we get it across? So where do we ground it? I guess that's what I'm interesting. It's, it's, you know, it's easy, an easy thing to say, um, but often coming back at you is a lot of evidence of, you know, not there not being much hope. So where do we find it and how do we, how do we, how do we convey it, I guess, is, is, is what I'm really asking. Well, sure. Th through the practice of doing, of being, you know, uh, it's one thing to, to lose hope. But as artists, as creators, we have to keep doing what we do. We also have to keep supporting others to do what they can do, because if we don't, what does the future have for our generations to come? So for me, the practice is by doing, by enabling others to do what they can and just supporting others, uh, creating networks of support so that the artists can do what artists do, and that is create. 
Thank you. Okulani, do you have thoughts on bringing in new younger voices and, and hope? For me, when it when you talk about art and, and what its role is, sorry, I get emotional every time I speak about this, but like um, for me personally, art has always been a way in which I can navigate emotion. Um, and when you talk about climate justice for so long, it's so easy to feel disheartened after all of the evidence is stacked against you. And for me, when you think about art, it truly is a way to navigate your grief um, and, and express your grief without letting it consume you. And so through art, you can feel, um, and, and I always tell people this, um, your grief is absolutely valid and you are allowed to grieve, um, but you are not allowed to let it consume you and you are not allowed to let it be the end of you. Um, but always take the opportunity to grieve because the climate crisis is something that is very difficult, especially for island people, um, because this isn't something that we will live. It's something we are currently living. Um, but through art, you can navigate that grief. You can go through the waves and you can go through the motions and through it, you can find hope. And through it, you can find community in art. You can find other people who are grieving in different forms of mediums, who are sharing their emotions and sharing their stories in different ways, but you find them and, and those stories tie you back. Um, and slowly you find yourself and you find your way back into yourself so you can come back, pick up the pieces and do the work again. Um, so for me, arts is very much um, very important when it comes to self-expression, but also in um, making sure self-care is important. Um, sometimes, you know, you don't have to share all your stories and all your art with everybody. Sometimes it's just for yourself. Um, so for me, art is very much um cathartic process. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, I have a love hate relationship with my art and, and I'm sure all artists do. So I think that's really how I see, um, art being navigated and used within the climate spaces as well as activism. Thank you. So let's turn and talk a little bit about amplifying the voices of artists, because sometimes our art is just for us, as, as you've said, and, and sometimes we have trouble getting it out, as Kendall has said, because of funding issues. So let's talk about amplifying the voices. And I want to hear from you your thoughts on the Just Stop Oil protests recently. And, and I'm sure you've seen you've seen these. Some of some of them have been around, you know, very, very well known works, works of art where they've symbolically thrown various various types of things food and other things at at art they I, I quickly say the art has not been damaged but it has got them headlines it has not got them a, a lot of attention and a lot of criticism criticism because many have said this has turned people off so what what are your thoughts on the just stop oil protests as they have been using art and sort of performance as well i i think um ina maria can i start with you Um, I, when it comes to the Just Stop Oil protest, especially being an artist, I don't know how I would feel if I saw my artwork being splashed with, uh, with food because I know how much energy it takes. And I also know that Van Gogh is one of the very few artists who did not actually even live his success, but who was very close to nature. But at the same time, I also understand the desperation of the people in the global north. So um, when it comes to the Just Stop Oil protests, especially when it includes uh, mm -hmm. vandalizing art, I, I am very sensitive towards it, especially as an artist who works a lot with their hands. And... Um, I think it's a fine line between activism and and also coming from the global south and knowing how how climate justice is a matter of urgency or a matter of survival. I feel that sometimes these types of protests they take away the spotlight from what we are really experiencing. I mean, Tuvalu is currently sinking mm -hmm. as we are speaking. Uh, the droughts are literally ravishing people. So how can we as communities, global South and global North really come together to tackle the elephant in the room and not necessarily victimize others? You know, that is what I would say when it comes to the Just Stop Oil protest. But I think everyone has to do what they feel is needed 
but I think a level of respect towards the other people's or like what they are going through is also quite important and why the conversation between global north and south is actually very critical at this moment of how we can come together as a global community. Mm -hmm. Right. So, the, so sometimes the the connection between the problem, as you're saying, showing the problem, and the action is not exactly very clear. So, yeah. you know, one one could understand throwing food or oil at a big oil company's headquarters or something like that. But the artwork in a museum, sometimes the connection is not so is not so perfectly clear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else has any reflections or thoughts on the? just stop oil protests i mean is uh, I, all I, attention good attention kendall um no not not, not immediately but i think it, it can be possible to make use of even bad attention so that last point you make there so about how to make how how to to make the correlation for okay. the public and there are there's always going to be members of the public who are against it for all a whole range of reasons so you're never going to reach everybody that, that that's a given but how to how to make the correlation between the two? That's that that that's where the issue come up. I have, I have a lot a lot of sympathy um, for them and the fact that people that things have, have been pushed to that point where it has to get as drastic as that. And they're very very careful to 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 um to 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 make sure that the art itself is not actually you know fundamentally damaged. They're very very careful about it. The media is not careful to point that out. The media is making it look as though they're actually seriously damaging art and so on. So you know there, there, there's the, the media being here, mainstream media being hugely hypocritical about it. But fundamentally, I I, I think they, they they move in the right direction. It's how to make the correlation in a way that more members of the public, you'll never get all, can can see how they how they start together. It's easier to see it in say in something like like say Standing Rock, where you're actually there on site at the actual spot where the damage is being done, and so on and so on. But how to how to how to, to when you take it out of that context to bring it somewhere else and and for the, it's able to speak to the issue, that's that's the strategic thing that they have to try to work out. Yeah. Right. So let, let's talk a bit about connections, because, yes, the question is, uh, in, in a Maria raised it, how do we connect with people across very different backgrounds, mm -hmm. very different impacts, very different levels of development? And, uh, and I'm using that word with quotation marks around it. Yeah. How do we actually make those connections and strategize so that our energy doesn't get dissipated by actions that maybe turn people off or turn them off more than is necessary or are not particularly clear in? In, in in their in their objectives how do we reach across geographical boundaries experience communication issues lack of funding um audrey you want to start with that <laughs> very difficult one very difficult question um, look i'm um, just going back to the earlier discussion one of the key issues is it brings a lot of media attention yes but it goes back to that issue of purpose. You know, we talked about correlation of where's the human face and the impacts of it. Uh, it's obviously about wealth and power, but for us in the Pacific Islands, what does that mean for us? Where is our visibility on these issues? And so it becomes like a power dynamic of the, the North talking to the North itself, but how are they connecting with others? How are they able to empower us, Pacific Island people or other communities globally to talk for themselves about the impacts of climate change? So it's a very interesting dynamic of media and power relations where you have to hit on the big numbers in the famous museums to make an impact, to draw media attention on such issues of survival for for many of us globally so it's an interesting dichotomy of power and relations and and how um, many of us are invisible in the global media on on these particular issues so sure, sure. i'm not some i'm not answering the question so to speak but i'm kind of like uh, commenting on those power dynamics and relations Sure. One of the things I did notice, though, I completely take in your point about what the media covers and doesn't cover is, you know, I, for over the period of weeks when this was happening, I started I looked at all the comments under the media stories. And what I did see there did actually give me some hope that perhaps the the actions were not pointless and alienating in, in their entirety because people were engaging with each other. 
about it. You know, there were lots of people saying this is nonsense. You know, how could anything like that be allowed? But then there were people taking them on in the in the chat in the comments. And I thought, well, if at if at the least it's got people talking, engaging, then I think there is some some value to doing something that you know is going to get media attention. When perhaps if you you are standing outside uh, your threatened wetland in your country or your new your 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 oil pipeline that's running across a continent, maybe the the, the international media is not going to cover it. Mm -hmm. So there was that that mm -hmm. aspect to it. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts on how we can strategize together, connect with each other better, make sure that our 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 actions don't don't contradict each other, if you know what I mean. Fight against each other. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult, but I, I want you're, you've all done this in many different ways, including through the COP. Do you have any other thoughts on that? Anyone, Kendall? You look like you have well, a I'm, burning I'm, I'm answer. Just I'm just wondering. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering out loud. I mean, one, one of the um, one of the so kind of like alternative um, news media I, I, I check a lot is um, the Double Down News from Patreon. And you know, they, I I love their, their their coverage of things is is not you know, it's not establishment. So what I wonder about, and I understand the difficulties of that too. But what I wonder about is what are the possibilities of say like the just stop the, the standard just stop oil protesters, um, and like person say to 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 go to go back to us here in our islands, our different situations, and the activists there making making actual connections actual physical connections and getting and, and, and getting the word out there so, so that so that alongside and you won't get it in the mainstream media at first so that alongside the the, the videos that show you yeah them splashing ring, you also have you know video clips of persons from the pacific islands from the caribbean speaking and all that's running all that all that's being juxtaposed so that the wider issues are being clearer sometimes it's just just the um the protesters and rightfully so they speak of they make reference to they quote statistics etc about the floods in pakistan etc cetera, etc cetera. and that that's that's fine but in a way that is still speaking on behalf of i think what you, what you actually need is right then and their persons from pakistan say as part of the whole you understand the, the whole presentation that's being sure. done but the mainstream media will not do it so it's to make the connections with the alternative media that will do it. And hopefully some of that will leak into mainstream media. You know? So coordination, so connections, but also coordination, because coordination. I've also seen, I've seen a bit of that happening as well, where there are actions that are similar, they're not identical, but they're similar and they're playing out in different countries in different ways. So that kind of coordinated approach. Do any of you have examples of either mm -hmm. specific um results brought about by art and activism with with a caveat that i think it's very difficult to say a causes b or yeah. successful collaborations between commonwealth countries or between the global north and the global south do you have any examples that you'd like to share with with our listeners here today hmm. <laughs> nobody okay it's, yeah. it is a difficult one. <laughs> it is a difficult one, but um, yeah, I think I think for me, uh, being able to exhibit uh, my work because I had the opportunity to exhibit it at Stockholm Plus Fifty, and uh, and like I say, because it's visual art, it normally gives me the opportunity to communicate with people that would not normally go to protest. But also having it just in an exhibition space where activists meet is also maybe not enough. But the good thing about the specific platform was that you also had politicians within the space. So it's it is a different type of communication, but I think it is a dialogue that really needs to take place on how, like Kendall said, we can really highlight the voices of the people that are already being impacted. Even if they, okay, like the mainstream media, they don't talk about what is happening in the global South. 
And, uh, you know, like if stop oil would also like attack them, you know, like DBC and what. <laughs> I okay. think that's a bit more effective, you know. I, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> okay, some food that, some food thrown at the media. One of the, yeah. things, that, one of the things I think about in my time as um, a, an activist when it was my full-time job is that we, we often did not have, have time to reflect on our successes or on the, the work that we had done or on the collaborations that we had successfully done. And I think that was something that was missing in, in often in the funding that we received. So I'd like, I just like to suggest that, that actually all of us doing this work need some time to evaluate and write up or document some of the work that has been done because a, an enormous amount of work has been done and has had impact. But very often there is no funding, there is no um, no staffing to actually write it down so that it's available for other people. That's that was something I felt mm. when I was doing this as a full time as a full time job. So I don't know if any of you want to add that to that. I mean, maybe that's something the Commonwealth Foundation could champion. How how we look back at the work that has been done or and or is being done at the moment and try to try to document and evaluate its success and and things like that so that we don't all struggle you know with our minds okay have i have i had a success yeah. I, I, do, do you agree that often you don't have yeah. the time to reflect uh, on on uh, what's worked what hasn't worked fact fact yeah you, you just feel like you're constantly under pressure you know yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. you're putting out fires you're yeah. underfunded you're under resourced and you don't often have the time to sit down and and think about about the, the questions that we were just yeah. deliberating on yeah. Yeah. yeah i i do like myself the idea of of coordinated activities across um mm -hmm. across you know I, I we total is one of our big um oil companies here in jamaica and i find myself driving past them and thinking eh, i wonder if you how you'd like some food thrown at <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, if i get around to doing it you'll all be the you'll all be the first 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 to know uh, so we're moving a little bit now into um the end and before we start taking some questions so before we start doing that does anyone <coughs> have, I, have i left out anything that you would like to say or talk about about your own work or the situation in your own countries um especially on the question of hope and and, and the sense of forward movement um just, just one thing because you, you had earlier on you mentioned what like hope and new voices different voices um you know the 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 nature of, of the nature of art is, is is that sometimes the same the same thing every time the same thing has to be said in different ways in new ways they're, they're younger persons they're different persons coming up they they're creating their own art forms they, they they're plugged into other kinds of things and sometimes the, the you know the, the, the yeah the, the way an older generation would do it may not reach them to the same degree you know so it is really 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 crucial that younger voices newer voices are coming in with their ways of taking that same message to reach their you know to reach their own so i think i think that, that that's something that all room always has to be made for them in fact they, they, they're going to barge in and, and and you know and, and create their room but um when when um <clears throat> When, when, um, sorry, I've forgotten the name from, from, from Sophia Alas. I mentioned about the old and the young coming together. You, we need that. We need that. Right. We need the same, the same thing said in different ways will reach different kinds of people. So, really, really crucial to bring in the young. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the, the very excellent timekeepers are keeping me on track here. Mm -hmm. And so we have our first mm -hmm. question, which I'm going to read out and then see which of you would like to take it. It's from Theo Orman Skeeping, and he says, artists are often ta tasked with communicating the urgent need to address climate change, its lived experiences, untold stories, and livable visions for the future in which climate justice has prevailed. This is essential to drive the social change we need to end the climate crisis. Yes, I think we all feel that, that mission but how else do you ask can artists contribute to understanding and addressing climate change for example can artists contribute as climate change researchers by documenting and contributing knowledge and by interventions that address non-economic loss and damage within their communities 
Mm-hmm. We were sort of, I mean, in a way he's been, he's thinking what we were just talking about, you know, because we were just, we were just kind of discussing that uh, yeah. a bit, you know, um, the, the need to document mm-hmm. some of our experiences and the, and the lived experiences of the people that we work closely, mm-hmm. closely with. Do you think that is a, that is a viable and doable thing for climate activists to do some of this documentation? Um, Okalani, what do you think? Yeah, I definitely see artists working within um, consultation spaces within communities um, because artists um, and us specifically are all wordsmiths when it comes to having those community conversations. You have people who are at the grassroots who want to share their story but cannot properly articulate their emotions and what they're feeling. Um, and so what I see the role of artists playing is when those stories are collected, mm-hmm we can create a way, um, we can navigate or weave a story with the stories that they have given or they have trusted us with. Um, And so when it comes to bringing together reports and bringing together statistics or actual real stories from the communities who are at the, um, are at the forefront or in those areas, um, sometimes it's very difficult to phrase, phrase certain stories in, in a way that's easy to understand and also straightforward. Um, so I, I, I do see artists in that in that capacity working together with perhaps NGOs and governments to really bring those stories together in one united um, voice um, so that it so that it is kind of something that we could all bring and we can all share together um, and, and, and really articulate in a way that everybody in the general public can understand. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. From Nancy Ann, <clears throat> is there a way when you're entering a creative space that it makes you as an artist or poet think differently about climate change, either making it more real to you or to have a more positive sense of it being resolved, or in other words, a new way to address it? Audrey or Kendall? So what, what's your entry point into the climate crisis as a, as a poet? Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I don't enter it, first of all, as a poet. I, I don't think anybody enters, no, no matter more, how much of an artist you are, I don't think you enter it, first of all, as, as an artist. You enter it, first of all, as a human being. I'm a father, I'm a grandfather, I have a 26-year-old son, I've got a grandchild. So that, that is where I enter it from. And, and the, the art is, is, is going into, into that inner life that, that, that is dealing with the questions of what is going to happen to them? What's going to happen to my, my, my 26-year-old son who is just, you know, getting himself at a certain point in life, he's got to, you know, somebody's going to raise a family. And I say, what's going to happen to them? So it's out of that that the art comes. Um, so yes, things, it, it can become more, more urgent for me um, when, I'm not even sure it becomes more urgent for me when, when I'm going into doing it with, with, with poetry or plays. I think the, the urgency is what makes me go into it, um, you know, as a, as a poet or as a playwright or whatever. So um, I, I, I'm probably not even answering the question, but but for me, it's it's. I don't think I'm entering it from any fundamentally different space than any human being who who realizes we are part of this incredible being called Earth. You know, right? Honestly. So it's so so. What makes it real for you is your your family, your lived experiences, yeah, your yeah, connection yeah. to place, and it is from that that your whatever art um, that you practice flows. Exactly so. That's that's exactly. kind of what you're saying. Audrey, you have anything to add to that? Um, basically, I just want to reiterate what, what Kendall shared and that when we enter this space, it's as a human being first and foremost. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. For me as a poet, as an artist, there's also, and as a Pacific Island woman, there's that added weight on me to be sure to be uh, representing many other voices that may not have that space to do it. So uh, there's that added weight of responsibility that my voice is just one of many, including my my family, including for my daughters and, and as an Okalani's poet, my unborn grandchildren in the future. So that's totally uh, connect with Kendall's comments as well. Right. So from Michelle Wilson, how can European and North American artists use their privilege to create a platform for Southern voices and visions? So how can those who already ha- who are already likely to be covered by the media make space for, for those of us in the global South? 
Ina Maria, you want to try that? You you mentioned being exhibition space, you know, where where you thought there were new people who were looking at your work. Do you have other thoughts about how how European and North American artists can can help artists in the global south? Yeah, um, yeah, I have I have a lot to say, but uh, <laughs> one of the one of the key things that I believe in is uh, hosting workshops within the countries that where it's actually happening. So even you as an artist from the global north, come here, live our reality. Let's have a workshop. So with indigenous people from our continents uh, or, or from the Pacific Islands and let's exchange, but then also make sure that our voices are also exhibited within your galleries within the North because right. it is our co-joint story. So I totally believe in workshops. It's something that I also do when it comes to documenting, uh, asking people to write stories, to make art. And I really feel that you really get a lot out. And also because art is such a universal language that even if you don't speak the language, you can, you feel it, you know, like you, you feel sure. it, even the song, you feel it. I'm not, not talking about language per se, but like, song or a film or movement or even visual it is something that really communicates and resonates with so many people so why don't we start having these exchanges so we can really represent the people the way that they should be represented and give them the space and the voice to express themselves but in your own specific platform either it be a tate modern or wherever you know that is what i think and one of the ways to go forward is Thank you. So I have another three questions. So this one is from Wagita Joseph. It's imperative to have a balance with the, within the ecosystem so that different species can continue to co coexist in a harmonious manner. How can different communities be brought on board so that we're able to strike a balance and find solutions which, to issues which affect us in equal measure? Um, how to bring different communities on board. Kendall, you want to talk about that? I'm not sure everybody is affected in equal measure, but yeah, yeah. Um, and well, we're, 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 we're coming to the end of our session, so yeah. brief well, responses. Very, very briefly, I'll, I'll be very, very brief. I, I, I think, I think you, you, you have to start with a vision of, of a type of society, because to me, all these, all these problems to me can only finally be solved, resolved within a certain type of society. And I'm and I'm going to avoid all the all the labels that come up about right and left and Marxist and socialist and capitalist and so on. I'm going to avoid all those for the time being. But but a, a certain you, I think I think you need some some baseline ideas about how a society should be organized. Um, and it's out of that um how uh, it's out of that that that's the 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 ways in which communities are brought together um come I, I don't know i don't know if i'm being clear um the, the 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 question was a little bit general and i've just got to pin it down and say it, it starts to me with a vision of a certain type of society that you want to see and then yeah the, the communities are, are brought together to help create that society right yes i think you do have to start to talk about what it is that the removing towards not just what yeah. you're moving away from yeah. in maria yeah. Uh, I think uh, the best way forward is to is to start decolonizing the minds because colonialism has forced this narrative on who we are as global South people. They see us as these people that are incapable of actually even dealing with a crisis when we are already living it. We also have solutions, but because of the narrative that we need the global North to survive, or for us to even be developed, whatever that means, that is, I think, what is actually keeping society down. So we really need to start decolonizing our minds, decolonize history, and also accept the fact that other people living elsewhere are also people, they also have their own ways and also respect those cultures. So for me, the most important thing is to decolor is decolonization work. Thank you. So from Klaus Swarboy, I hope I said his name right, how motivated are our African presidents to put pressure on the West to address the question of pollution and not to be seen as a dumping site? So I think that's for you too, Ina Maria. How motivated? Can you speak to motivation? 
Well, <laughs> when we talk about plastic, for example, it's a byproduct of oil. And we also know that, I mean, like Kendall's song said, they are pushing us to buy things that we don't need. Like, for example, every year Apple has got a new iPhone, but at the same time, the old iPhones end up on the dumping sites. But we don't talk about the fact that it is children that are digging up the cobble so we can have our electric cars mm -hmm. or so that we can have new new phones. So Africa is not a dumping site. It basically means that we, we are taking control. If our leaders are continuing to play the puppets to the Western leaders, then we are, then we, 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 I just have to remind them that we are the future. Our children and our grandchildren are the future and we are not going to let them get intimidated by polluters for them to accept all that rubbish because it is already affecting our communities. Rivers are overflowing with plastic. People, right. they can't even fish anymore. So it is a matter of survival and keep your plastic to yourself or take care of it, Coca-Cola, again, you know, even though there was the sponsors of COP, you know, like it does not make any sense. So stop your greenwashing. And again, like uh, Antonio Guterres said, I like this quote, there should be zero tolerance for greenwashing. We don't need the rubbish, we don't need the oil, we don't need the gas. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so I think we're coming to the to the end and I, I'll just ask one last question, which I'll ask you to respond to in your final closing remarks, just a couple of sentences. So this question is from Asari Yor Jamuel. What are the, some of the significant measures that the governments of each Commonwealth country that is prone to climate change could put in place to curb this menacing problem? So in your sort of final remarks about this morning that you'd like to say, can you think about maybe just one thing that you think Commonwealth governments could put in place? Um, can I start with Audrey? All I can say is for our Commonwealth uh, leaders to follow what our Pacific Island leaders have been doing on a global platform. And that is climate change is the, the greatest existential threat to humanity. So in other words, follow the Pacific leaders and they are leading the way on this issue for the Commonwealth and the world. Thank you, Okalani. Honestly, it is echoing what Audrey has already mentioned. Um, a lot of the, like the Pacific leaders have really done a lot of work to advocate for climate emergency um, and climate justice to be really at the forefront of these conversations. Um, and to have the support of Commonwealth when having these conversations is so fundamental. So I do urge Commonwealth nations and Commonwealth leaders to really support and pioneer these conversations as well within their own regions and within their own countries. Um, because at the end of the day, we are a united voice and we are still islands. <laughs> so um, we all have the same experiences and the same stories. Um, and we should be fighting for the same, um, the same cause. Um, but I do applaud um, Kendall and Ina because they're doing the work. And a lot of the times, um, a lot of the people within these Commonwealth countries are advocating and pushing at the grassroots level. But it's the leadership that really needs to start making a move. Um, so my urge, my urgency is towards the leaders of the Commonwealth um, rather than the community to really push for climate justice to be at those conversations. Right. But I guess, you know, for our leaders to take it seriously, we need we need those of us, you know, wherever we are to insist that our leaders um, take it seriously. Kendall, you do, do you have I'm going to ask you all for a final call to action before we close. But do you have any any suggestions as to what what Commonwealth leaders should be doing specifically? Um, you, there, there, there needs to be. Oh, God, I'm not I'm, I'm, so, so there needs to be a, a, a rethinking and, and, and national dialogue about what progress is, because all, all they're doing is in the name of progress. So there needs to be a re-questioning, a big public re-questioning in all kind of fora, town hall meetings and so on, as to what progress is. And to me, you have to me, you have to start there, and then yeah. What, what development means? We we banned that road, what yeah. that word around a lot, you know, and it seems yeah, to me it's used yeah. to describe every concrete block that can be put so in the earth, no matter the yeah, that. That, that, yeah, and 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 it's never interrogated, you know. We don't go into what, what exactly are we meaning by yeah. by this development, you know. Ina Maria, anything about what Commonwealth governments can do or 
Well, mm-hmm. yeah, they can, they can, they can all start by signing up the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. It is one of the many ways forward that is literally going to save humanity once we start working together as a global community and not as global south, global north leaders, activists, but it is time that we come together. And I think it is one of the many great initiatives that uh, our Commonwealth leaders can actually start looking into and sign up to it, but also make sure that you do the work because we as activists are here to remind you that we put you in your place, we voted for you and we can also vote you out. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so last calls to action, using the arts. Do, do you have to, to those who are listening to the people they will leave this morning, this afternoon to go and talk, talk to the, their friends? What's the, what's the last call to action you have for using the arts on this existential threat facing facing humanity? Okay, Lani. Mine is very easy. Um, less listening, um, more action. Um, that would be my my definite my definite takeaway. Um, don't just hear me. Um, use it as fuel to actually create action within your communities um, and within your countries and your respective places of leadership. So when you are moved by the work of an artist, whatever that kind of artist is, Mm -hmm. you talk about it. You take that to others, essentially, is is, is what you're saying. Don't just be inspired, but, you know, be inspired to act is what I say. Yeah. Okay. Kendall, your your call to action. What what Uh, should people listening do? Um, well, I, you, you, you pretty much said it. Um, the, 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 the artist puts out his or her work. Yeah, take it. Talk about it. You know, talk about it. Talk to someone else about it. Encourage someone else to look at it, <laughs> listen to it, whatever. So it's, you know, little seeds, little seeds. But yeah, just that, that's something that anybody can do, just to talk about somebody's work. Sure. Yeah. Audrey? Audrey, you? <laughs> 1.5 to stay alive, 1.5 <laughs> to survive. But most importantly, share our voices, use your social media platforms. If you're an artist, try and get on a digital platform, get a younger voice to help you because we have things to say. We're saying it, we've said it, share it. Thank you. Amplify the voices. Ina Maria, you have the last word. Um, art is a universal language and we as artists and as activists, it's like Kendall said, it comes from our heart. It comes from a place of frustration and we don't, even though the frustration doesn't always come out, the fact is that we do have stories to tell. And like all the panelists say, please share our voices, share our stories and remember that we are together in this fight. We are not apart. Global North not global south but together as a global community and that is what we need to start doing as artists Mapa. So, <laughs> so thanks to everyone for being here with us um, you can continue this conversation by joining the commonwealth foundation's digital discussion platform which is there's a link in the chat and we're going to leave you with some images from the foundation's digital exhibition a lens on the climate crisis in africa depicting the devastating impact of the climate crisis there thank you to all our wonderful panelists and to all of you for listening and to the commonwealth foundation for making this possible.